Hi, my name is PJ. I'm just making a video to uh, show my Iron Maiden collection, which I have mainly on vinyl. Though I do have uh, a CD collection that's currently on its way, and I've got a couple of cassette albums as well. But uh, this video is mainly to show uh, their studio albums, at least the ones that I own. I don't have the complete collection yet, but um, I do have uh, a number of their records. So the ones that I bought, or that I have at the moment, would be, uh, say, you know, most Iron Maiden fans probably have this one, which is the album's collection. So this has got Iron Maiden up as far as Seven Sun, which is showing you back here. So that's the first uh, seven studio albums and their live album, uh, Live After Death which was released in 1985. And that was the first record I ever heard by Iron Maiden. My brother uh, came home with it in 1985 on its release. And I was just a child, but my brother was a teenager at the time. So uh, he listened to the record and I immediately just fell in love with the sound of the band and uh, really loved them. So I have this one. So I'm just a quick look at the album so you got right now so there you got seven sound summer in time live after death it's power slave here peace of mind number of the beast killers and iron maiden which went back in as well yeah it's Iron Maiden. so that'll be their first eight records released and these are the 2014 reissues and what I've also got is this which is the picture disc collection same albums um, I got this off of eBay and it was not cheap but um, all the records are still sealed so none of them have been opened uh, let's see, glare, get off that glare. Uh, so, what I know of this box set is that um, apparently, like, the picture lists themselves are relatively easy to get, but what's difficult to get is the box. This box, because I read online and I don't know if this is actually true, because I just can't believe that it is true that only 200 boxes were made, which to me just seems kind of nuts <laughs> why would you put out a collector's uh edition of uh you know your albums and only make a really really like limited edition of um of the box that you can put them in it just seems ridiculous so i i just i refuse to believe that only 200 of these boxes were made so but if anybody can like confirm or clarify that exactly in the comments then i would appreciate it because if there are only 200 of these boxes, then that's kind of idiotic. So that's those. And then I have okay, the smaller box. This is the original small box that came. And the records I've got in here are um, the new album, Book of Souls. So that's their latest release, and I just had this from Fear to Eternity. Both of those two records there are triple discs, so that's six vinyls going into this. And then I have this, which was not fucking cheap. Uh, Brave New World. So there. So this was the like uh, Bruce Dickinson's and Adrian Smith's comeback record for them. Because uh, Smith had left in 1990 and Dickinson had left in 1993 and they both returned on this record. So it's a picture disc and it's a pretty decent album. Uh, the Wicker Man song, the opening record, uh, the opening song, sorry, it is, um, it's a really, really good song and it's, it was a hell of a single to come back with. And this began into the 2000s, so... Iron Maiden's kind of rocky 90s had come to an end 
because the band uh, the band didn't perform as well in the 1990s as they had done in the 80s. So oh, you fell out there. So those would be the main kind of bulk, but I do have another one here. I have another large box. Uh, same albums <laughs> are inside it, but uh, this time I'm going to go through this one a bit more, but because these are actually original pressings and not the the reissues. So, so the first one here is Iron Maiden. This is a Fame pressing, which are kind of a lot of people kind of frown on them as being inferior quality. A sound quality quality to the original but um, I actually find that listening to them perfectly fine uh, they sound really good in comparison to the digital remasters I think the original sound better and even this the fame actually sounds a bit better to me anyway so that's our main okay, we'll just start getting these out and then this is another fame one as well and this one's Killers, and this came out in 1981. And it was the second and last album to feature Paul Diano. And um, this was the first record to feature Adrian Smith. So, oh yeah, I'll just mention, I suppose, that the lineup on this record, just, I'm assuming anybody watching this probably already knows. But the lineup here was Paul Diano on vocals with Steve Harris on bass guitar, uh, a man named Dennis Stratton on uh, guitar, Dave Murray on guitar, and a man, uh, Clive Burr, on drums. And Clive Burr had actually only just joined Iron Maiden, replacing a man called Paul Sampson, I think his name was. Um, uh, this record is not particularly popular with a lot of fans and it's especially not popular with the band due to the production by Will Malone which the band did not like at all and to be honest with you I'm not a, a huge fan of it uh, myself I think uh, Martin Birch did a lot better uh, producing the records and creating very unique sounds on each Iron Maiden record um, so there are fans of this album and the way this album was produced and the sound but to me and I suppose to a lot of Iron Maiden fans, it's it's inferior uh, production, and it kind of they don't like. No one really likes it. I don't like it. The band doesn't like it. Um, so yeah, that was that was Iron Maiden, nineteen eighty, and also this is Eddie, the monster uh, created by Derek Briggs, and. Um, yeah, Derek Riggs created what I think is some of the best artwork uh, of the 80s in terms of heavy metal album covers. And uh, what Iron Maiden did with their character kind of inspired another, a lot of other bands to put like artwork on their uh, records, kind of like spooky or horror kind of like things, you know, like uh, Suicidal Tendencies or um, Exodus, bands like that, Tempest. Um, Things, other bands, loads of bands. Uh, in terms of mascot as well, kind of Megadeth tried to have a mascot as well with uh, Rattlehead, but he never really took off and didn't really have the same kind of staying power as Eddie. So that was Eddie's first incarnation and then into Eddie's second incarnation on Killers, where he has a, he looks a fair bit different. Um, so on this one, you have the same lineup as the previous album, except, as I mentioned earlier, the addition of, you see there, Adrian Smith. Now we can see him. Adrian Smith, Steve Harris, Diano, Dave Murray, Clever. And they interestingly put Martin Birch's picture on the album as well, uh, which is unusual. And you can see, uh, oh, the other side, down here is the Fame logo. You can see the Fame logo in this corner as well. Not really, but okay. Um, yeah, so this was a really good album that had some classic tracks in it, like uh, Rothschild, 
uh, murders in the Rue Morgue and Killers in particular kind of stood out, but um, there's a lot of other songs in there as well that I really like, like Innocent Exile and Prodigal Son, Purgatory, Drifter. The whole album, basically, I think it's a really, really good album. And it was the first album as well. Um, you know, I keep kind of going back to it, but I think the songs that continue from this, that they still play to this day, is um, Iron Maiden, the song, and Running Free. And occasionally they do still pull out Phantom of the Opera. And they don't really play anything else. I think Prowler and Transylvania, I don't think they've played either of those since the early 90s. Um, when they were on the final tour with uh, Bruce Dickinson, 93, uh, during when his first tenure of the band was coming to an end. Uh, hopefully I won't have to go back to Iron Maiden again, <laughs> that record. Okay, so we are on to the next one, which is a classic album, basically. There's even a show called Classic Albums that featured this record. This has some of the Iron Maiden's biggest hits on it. So it has like Children of the Damned, The Prisoner, 22 Acacia Avenue, The Number of the Beast, Run to the Hills, and Hallowed Be Thy Name. All songs that are considered classic Maiden songs and were on their set list for many, many years. The only ones that I've, on this that I've never actually heard live would be the opening track, Invaders, and the second last track called Gangland. So... It's the original picture there, and just interestingly, you can see on this, if I can just get the, the 2014 version out. You see there are differences where they ch made changes. So you see the 2014 and the original. The original one is kind of a blue hue on the sky and the reproduction is black and that's because they actually made a mistake at the time and the sky was supposed to be black like it is in uh this one but uh when it went to the printers they printed it as uh, blue by accident so that's the original blue one and they also changed the picture on the back so the band photo on the back is slightly different as well the most noticeable thing you'll see is so I'll just get this right, is Bruce Dickinson's holding the torch uh, differently. The other band members are relatively the same, except, uh, you know, just minor differences in stance, really. But yeah. So that's those two records. Uh, the Number of the Beast, absolute, absolute classic record. And uh, it's really, really really good album even if you're not into like Iron Maiden or heavy metal I, I strongly recommend uh, listening to that record so the next one they followed up Peace of Mind with another I just forgot to mention something and it's actually quite a big deal this record featured another lineup change which was the departure of Paul Diano and bringing in Bruce Dickinson um, that was a huge risk at the time, changing your singer, particularly for Iron Maiden, as they were going up in popularity, coming off the Killers tour, and they were really like gaining ground and becoming popular, and people were getting into them, and then all of a sudden it's like Paul Diano had to go. Um, the band didn't want him in the band anymore, and Paul Diano didn't really want to be in the band anymore. He found the, the extensive amount of touring that Iron Maiden did uh, exhausting. So... He had to go. And Bruce Dickinson was recruited from the band Samson. And uh, he became known as the Air Raid Siren due to his somewhat operatic style of singing. But, um, yeah, so that was another lineup change. So, a third album, third change in lineup. And then we're on to Peace of Mind, which I've already got. And once again, we have another lineup change. Uh, this time, Clive Bird, the drummer, uh, was removed from the band due to, I don't, like, they've not really gone into great detail about the exact circumstances, but uh, from what I remember, I think I saw in something, it might have been the early years DVD, uh, Clive Bird just said that, uh, you know, he kind of went a bit excess in, uh, in some areas, so I assume maybe drinking. Stuff like that. And uh, 
the band like gave him six months to sort himself out or they would throw him out of the band and uh, after six months he still hadn't sorted himself out so they got rid of him and they got in Nico McBrain who is an absolutely phenomenal drummer um, so he Nico opens the album with a killer drum beat with uh, Where Eagles Dare and this record came out in 1983 again produced by Martin Birch and it's, this album is a gatefold one so you can see there Kind of sitting at the table, or, no, they're sitting at the table. There's Nico, Adrian, Bruce, Dave, and Steve. And then in the background here, we have uh, I think that's Martin Birch, and that is Derek Riggs, so the producer and the the artist who uh, created the artwork are in the suits of armor. And you can just see them better over here. See Martin Birch and Derek Riggs. So this was another change in Eddie's look, where he was now bald and he had the lobotomy. And now uh, he's changed inside of Pat itself. So after the controversy of uh, the number of the beast, with a lot of people going calling them devil worshippers and stuff because of that song, the number of the beast, uh, they went with a slightly different approach with this one, and even uh, on the was it the song Still Life. Uh, there's a backwards recording and it's Nico McBrain. I can't remember exactly what he says, but the gist of it is just uh, don't meddle in things you don't understand. So that was that record. And they went off on another successful tour with this one. And uh, so they were still like releasing like really popular songs. And I think the songs that really stand out on this album are Revelations, uh, Flight of Icarus, Dodge Your Boots on the Trooper, um, Still Life, and To Tame a Land. I think those songs really stand out. And uh, But all in all, it's a very good album. Right from the opening track, where he goes there to the last song, every song is just good. And it's very rare for a band to be able to continually put out, you know, really good songs on each record, you know, into their fourth album. So... That's peace of mind, and then they went on to Power Slave. The following year, they brought up Power Slave. So this kind of had an Egyptian theme to it, and uh, it's another like real classic. So you got the band on the inlay here, and on the record itself. Let's see, where is yeah there? You got like the eye of Ra. Let me see that. It's on that. Um it's another, as I said, this is another just classic record. Um and what I like about this one as well is that it actually has the original leaflet that's inside it. So if you wanted to write off and get a t-shirt or a scarf, banner, a key ring, uh badge, you just filled in the order form. And uh, you ticked what you wanted, you sent off your postal order. And uh, they sent it back out to you. And before the days of the internet, this is how basically you joined the fan clubs and fans. So it's a really cool thing to, to have in there. So in this song, like immediately there's classics in here again, like um, Ace is High and Two Minutes to Midnight, the first two songs. Uh, other songs that really stand out would be those two were singles and then the other songs that really really stand out is uh, Power Slave and Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner which any R made fan will tell you like Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is a massive massive hit for them uh, never released it as a single but very very popular performed live uh, other songs then like Lost for Words, Big Aura um, The Jewelist and Flash of the Blade are all really good the only the weakest song I think on this is the Back in the Village song I just never really took to that one particular song uh, so yeah but considering this was their what their fifth album this is incredibly good incredibly good to still be releasing incredibly quality uh, tracks at this stage in your career and then we got on to their first live album from the Power Slave tour called the World Slavery tour 
Um, you get live after death. It's open at all. So you can see loads of uh, stuff like pictures inside. And there's loads of information and stuff printed on the inlay sleeves. And uh, the picture is absolutely amazing. Derek Riggs again just showcasing how good he is at, uh, at artwork. It's an amazing uh, picture. It's a bit light. So, there you go. So this is considered by many to be one of the best live albums ever released. Uh, you know, it's kind of up there with uh, Frampton Comes Alive and so records like that. So, yeah, this was the very first thing I ever heard of Iron Maiden, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Uh, my brother came home with this album in 85, and it was amazing. So, there was a bit of a problem coming off this tour because Bruce Dickinson was suffering from kind of exhaustion coming off it because of the amount of tour dates. And then the manager, Rod Smallwood, actually, when they released this, wanted the band to go out on a tour to support the live album, which was the tour supporting the previous album, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. But uh, Bruce Dickinson just said, like, look, you put any more dates, you know, on for us, I'm quitting the band. And uh, Bruce Dickinson said for a long time he actually even considered um, quitting music altogether. He was so tired at the end of the South tour. So... From there, we then move on to get it out. Summer in Time, which is an incredibly different sounding record. Like, if you just listen to all their albums, like Iron Maiden, Killers, Number of Beast, um, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, and then go straight to Summer in Time, it's just the difference in sound is like really jumps out at you from the very first opening guitar riff. Um, because they were using synthesizers a lot on this record and they were kind of experimenting and um, but what they did produce was like an amazing piece of artwork um, designed again by Derek Riggs where it has loads and loads of references to other things like there you can see in the neon lights it says Long Beach Arena you can see the time down here where it says 23 uh, 58 which is a reference to the song Two Minutes to Midnight uh, you can see somewhere up there, see where there's plenty, yeah, there's, oh, not there, there, there's a Spitfighter, so that's a reference to Aces High, and here you've got the Flight of Icarus, with Icarus uh, wings being burned and falling down. Then it's like a reference to Peace of Mind with uh, the Bruce Dickinson holding a brain. There's loads and loads of stuff in here, um, like the triangle and stuff, or the triangle, the pyramid, so it's got a reference to Blade Runner. And Blade Runner is written down here as well. On um yeah, the theater where it says Live After Death and uh plus uh Blade Runner is being shown and there's a HMV store in there as well. There's a there's a Pizza Hut in there, there's Batman's in there. Seriously, Batman's in there. I see if I can find him in case you never knew that. There, <laughs> right there, Batman is standing there. So but uh this was the first record where Bruce Dickinson, since joining the band, didn't contribute to the uh, songwriting, and that's because the stuff he wrote was uh, kind of rejected by the rest of the band. Because Bruce wanted to do, like, as he said at the time, uh, he wanted to make Iron Maiden's physical graffiti album and just do something really cool and crazy and all that. And uh, it didn't really come to pass. Uh, the other band just rejected his idea of wanting to do, like, more acoustic sounding stuff. And then. Um, yeah. So Bruce felt a little uh, dejected by uh, by having uh, his material refused. But um, this is an absolutely amazing piece of artwork. And funnily enough, the bands themselves weren't entirely happy with it. Uh, and Derek Riggs as well hated it because I think he just found it tedious to draw. And if you actually look at the shop in the background, there's a banner here that runs around and it wraps around here as well. And it's written backwards, but it reads as this is a very boring painting. So yeah, Derek Riggs did not like this album, although 
most people absolutely love this album album cover uh, it's basically got its own fan base <laughs> but it's, it's class okay so then we're on to uh, my personal favorite record by Iron Maiden and so they started with the experimentation with synthesizers and stuff and they kind of perfected it then with this record Sun on the Second Sun, 1988. It's absolutely brilliant. And uh, you can see Frozen in the thing there is all the previous eddies. So you see here we have, I assume the Power Slave time because he's kind of breaking out of chains and here he's in a straight jacket, so that's peace of mind. Uh, the Number of the Beast eddy. Up here you have the Killer's eddy. You stand there, it's just standing over the original album Iron Maiden, that Eddie, you can see the screaming face there, and then this is the Somewhere in Time Eddie, you can just see, uh, there you can see his hand and you can see the gun uh, going up there, uh, that's like the hardest one to figure out what it is, um, so yeah it's sort of set in the kind of Arctic and you have a book here, and then you have you can see Europe down here. You can see England there and Ireland, and uh, Northern Europe, a bit of Scandinavia over here, and what a like futuristic jet thing uh, chasing after. Uh, sounds like a skeleton of a fish. And on the front end, you have like Eddie, with uh, Eddie's son, a child, and his chest here. You have like the the apple. Adam, the Adam apple, Adam's apple. So, it's a really, really cool record. The songs off of this that are just absolutely brilliant is like the opening track, Moonchild and Infinite Dreams, and then like a really big hit for them was Can I Play With Madness and The Evil That Men Do as well was another popular hit. And then the song Seven Son and Seven Son is just an absolute epic. And then uh, it goes into the Prophecy and the Clairvoyant, which was another huge hit for them. And then it closes with only the good die young. And this uh, closed out the 1980s for Iron Maiden. Um, and it kind of closed out what a uh, kind of classic lineup era as well, because uh, after this record, Adrian Smith left the band, unfortunately. Going into No Prayer for the Dying. But um, yeah, this record is just absolutely fantastic and I would recommend of like personally I would recommend this album over all of uh, Iron Maiden records to listen to because I just love this album absolutely love it and uh, so to me this is Iron Maiden's best record though I am quite partial to Peace of Mind and Recently, uh, somewhere in time as well, like it took 29 years from its original release in 19, uh, 1986 for me to actually start to appreciate it now. But um, the songs like on Somewhere in Time that are just classics would be Wasted Years, Stranger in Strange Land, uh, I'll Really Like Sea of Madness as well. And they're all Adrian Smith songs as well. Uh, he really like, because Bruce took a back seat on that record in terms of songwriting. So Adrian Smith really stepped up, and uh, with this record, Bruce uh, Bruce was back and uh, back songwriting, and uh, produced uh, just a brilliant album. It's kind of a concept record, but I don't think it's really a concept record. <laughs> they just keep saying it is. But uh, so that, and then you go into the nineteen nineties. And they kicked off 1990 with, after producing what was one of their best albums, they then immediately released what is possibly one of their worst, which is uh, No Prayer for the Dying. Um, songs on this that are good. Uh, um, Suppose Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter is the best song on the record. But um, this is the first time where they brought out a record where there were just numerous forgettable songs on it. Like the ones that stand out are the opener, Tail Gunner, which is a really good song. 
uh, Holy Smoke then is it's a really good song as well it's kind of like taking a pop at televangelists and stuff and then uh, the song itself No Prayer for the Dying I think is really good but then after that immediately you start getting into the forgettable numbers like Fate's Warning uh, The Assassin Run Silent Run Deep Hooks and You you know there's not very memorable songs although Hooks and You is kind of catchy and I'm surprised they didn't release that as a single because it is quite catchy, but maybe it was because it was co-written by Adrian Smith that they decided not to. And then the album closes out. You can see here. See the band. Uh, you can see the inclusion there of Yannick Gears. He replaced Adrian Smith. And um, the album... It closes out with what I still to this day consider to be Iron Maiden's absolute worst song, which is Mother Russia. It is awful. It is a truly, truly terrible piece of songwriting. Um, I'm amazed it's on the record. Like if I was in the band or if I, like Steve Harris wrote it, I would like retcon this record and just remove that song. It's truly truly terrible um maybe some people will disagree with me but i still think it is it is the worst album they or it is the worst song that they uh, have written um mother russia but i hated this album when it came out i did not like it at all it was a massive step backwards for them they should have progressed with what they had done before with uh summer in time and Seventh Son, instead of like trying to go back to their roots, you know, trying to go back to the sound of Killers and uh, The Number of the Beast and stuff like that, and it just, it didn't work. Uh, the album wasn't well received critically. Uh, it wasn't particularly well received by fans. Um, yeah, it, it's just an all around dud. It's a complete dud. Uh, you can pick it up pretty cheap online because it's just not popular um but yeah so that's my they kicked off the 90s with a shit record a really really truly shit record but i've been listening to it recently and i like once i got this vinyl you know when it arrived in the door i was like well i better make sure you know it plays okay so i started listening to it and then you know i started to kind of appreciate some of the music a bit more but um, so at the time, like I literally hadn't listened to this record since 1990. So 25 years, I went without listen, listening to this album. Except for the odd time, like not listening to the record, but I would hear a song like Tail Gunner, Holy Smoke, or Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. They were the only ones I've ever really kind of hung around. I uh, see them every now and again. You know, I'd look up Iron Maiden on YouTube or something like that. And, you know, I'd play Bring Your Daughter or... Or holy, holy smoke and the uh, tail gunner song, but I would never listen to anything else. And as I said, even to this day, a lot of the songs on this are just forgettable. Uh, there's nothing really stand out on it at all. And after that, then we have Fear of the Dark. And this was Bruce Dickinson's last album with Iron Maiden. Uh, well, before he returned in 99, this was 1992. Bruce Dickinson left in 1993, and this was his final record with Iron Maiden for that time. Again, this is, I'd say this as an album is a big improvement over No Prayer for the Dying. But it still has forgettable songs on it. Uh, nothing that jumps out as a ooh, kind of a thing, you know, it's like there's nothing like majorly awesome about uh, the album. The songs, like I think the only song that they've kept in their, um, in their set list to this day is probably the song Fear of the Dark itself. They still pull that out, but they don't play anything else off of it. But there are some good songs on here. Um, the opening track, Be Quick or Be Dead, is actually pretty good. 
Uh, I think that was a Dickinson uh, Gares song. Yeah. And then it goes to From Here to Eternity. And From Here to Eternity is a really, really good song. Um, Afraid to Shoot Strangers is very good as well. That song actually kind of got a new lease of life with um, Blaze Bailey. Oddly enough, like, uh, it seemed to be a very popular song while he was in the band. Um, and then it goes on to like Fear is the Key, which is forgettable. Childhood's End. I actually really like that song. I love the drums on it. Uh, but yeah, again, not many people would immediately re recognize that song. And then it goes to Wasting Love, which is like a power ballad. I was like, what the hell was Harrison when he wrote that? But it's actually a really good album or song. Um, then you got stuff like The Fugitive, Chains of Mis Mis Misery, The Apparition, none of them particularly stand out. And then Judas Be My Guide, Weekend Warrior, and then Fear of the Dark. And as I said, like Fear of the Dark is really the only one that is kind of remembered from this record. So this was also the first album to have its artwork done by Melvin Grant rather than Derek Riggs. Um, so they kind of wanted to update Eddie for the 1990s. And they came out with this like bad thing, excuse me, and this kind of like bat or vampiric or whatever the hell growing out of a tree, Eddie. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so you see, there's another kind of like twisted Eddie bat on the back there as well. And uh, so this was 1992, and uh, in terms of my vinyl collection of albums, that's pretty much it. I don't have, I have Brave New World and I have The Book of Souls, which I showed already. And uh, that's it for uh, my records, my finals in terms of albums. But I do have other uh, Iron Maiden stuff, which I'll just put into a different video because I think this has gone on for ages. Yeah, I'm nearly 40 minutes on this like. So the next video I will show my first 10 years uh, box set which has all the singles plus some other uh, singles that I have here as well. So I'm trying to see them there. And I'll show those. Um, so that's basically all my vinyl. And so I have two albums on cassette actually. I have Seven Sun on cassette. And I just ended up buying it because it was cheap. And I really, really love this record. And uh, I also ended up with this. Which uh, I'd actually ordered Live After Death. But the guy sent me the wrong album. So I asked him, like, well, can you send me Live After Death? <laughs> because I don't really want this. And he just said, no, I can't find Live After Death. So I just keep that album and I'll refund your money. So I was like, mm, okay, cool. But um, I have actually thrown it in the record player a couple of or the my... Yeah, my record player have a stereo system there with uh that I bought back in the late nineties that plays a uh, CD cassette and vinyl and so I have actually listened to this a couple of times and it's pretty good. Well, not really. <laughs> uh, so that's it. That's my Iron Maiden vinyl collection and well, bar the first ten years and my other singles. But again, if I could just remind anyone who's actually made it to this point in the record. If you can confirm that there was only 200 of these boxes made, because I just can't believe that's true. It just, no, they can't have only made 200 of these boxes. It just doesn't make sense to me why they would do that. So anyway, that's my records. And this has been an incredibly long video, much longer than I originally thought it was going to be. I'll probably be like 20 minutes or something, but no. It's gone on near 40 minutes. So thank you for watching the video. And um, I'll post another video soon uh, showcasing the singles that I own. Bye.